So welcome, my name is Courtney Ozaki. I am the founder of the Japanese Arts Network, or JANE for short. Um, JANE is a national resource for artistic collaboration and connection that's based out of Denver, Colorado. And we are, um, we provide access to resources and develop programs and platforms that support and strengthen visibility for the Japanese and Japanese American artists in America who create with cultural intention and are vital to society. And we're dedicated to bringing together artists and communities and stakeholders by celebrating and advancing Japanese arts experiences in America. And this program um, is part of a partnership which we're very proud of with the McNichols Civic Center building and Denver Arts and Venues uh, for the program Kintsugi, The Art of Healing, Finding Beauty and Repair. And this is part of Denver Arts and Venues cultural partner program. So we're very excited to share with the Colorado community these opportunities to learn about ways to find peace and healing through the arts while exploring uh, multiple ways of discovering beauty and imperfection. Um, our teacher today is Margaret Ozaki Graves. She is a cultural consultant for Jane and is also a Japanese American soprano with stage and concert highlights, including Lyric Opera of Chicago, LA Opera and Santa Monica Library, Opera Steamboat, Arizona Opera, Colorado Springs and Boulderville, um, inside the orchestra, and then jump in work in Germany as, as well as many other accolades. Um, she's passionate about presenting song in new and compelling ways. And she actually just completed a virtual concert with Loveland Opera Theater entitled I um, uh, Love and, uh, what are these called, make, um, in enclosures. Uh, uh, brackets. <laughs> brackets, thank you. <laughs> and you may view that actually on our website, um, which is ja-ne.org. And this showcases um, her performance of classical vocal and traditional Japanese instrumental music in combination with works of other, um, other artists, both Japanese, Japanese American and not. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful. So I encourage you to, to watch. Um, we have some collaborative video too with um, with dancers and other types of artists. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'd I'd love to introduce Margaret Ozaki Graves. Hi everybody! Thanks for taking some time on this Friday. Um, my hope is to give you a little bit of relaxation, a little brain break for the day. Um, and we're going to go through a series of exercises. Uh, we're going to make some matcha, and then we're going to do um, a body work exercise from Alexander Technique called Constructive Rest. And then we're going to do some of the breathing exercises that I implement in my um, vocal practice, but for purposes of relaxation rather than for purposes of singing, unless you would like to sing. You're certainly welcome to, to do that. Um, so I want to make sure that um, you're having an experience with each of these exercises. Things may be new and different. So like Courtney said, um, and since this is being recorded, you are welcome to stay off camera but you're also welcome to come on camera, um, and especially if you have a particular issue or concern, um, it may be helpful for me to see you depending on what that is. So feel free to do um, what you need to do. Uh, I know that you may be familiar with some of these things and some of these may be brand new. So um, we're here to introduce them and, and help them. Um, and help you have an experience. So if you have any issues and um, want to raise a hand on the Zoom functions, ask a question in chat, or uh, come off of mute and ask a question, uh, come off of video, raise your hand and ask a question. Those are all ways that, um, that we can see and help you with that. Um, the other big thing that I want to in part is just some of the meditative 
and therapeutic applications of these um, activities and exercises. So I hope everyone leaves this hour a little bit more um, relaxed, a little bit more in a body more centered and um, both alert and, and calm at the same time. So, um, it is 9-11, so I'd like to start with a moment of silence for that. And I'm just going to go off video for that period of time. I'll see you in 60 seconds or so. Thanks for taking that moment to remember um, all of the people and, and important places that were lost in that tragedy, as well as the resilience of, of their families and our country. So I want to do an icebreaker, if everyone will humor me and come off of mute um, I when I'm call upon you and hopefully everyone's name is listed as something that um, when I announce you feel comfortable with. Um, so I would like you to pick a color and I would like you to pick an emotion, state, or feeling. And we're each going to introduce ourselves by your name of choice, the color, and emotion. So. Don't have to put a lot of thought into it. I'll start, I'm Meg, and I am purple exhaustion today. Courtney, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. sure. Um, my name is Courtney, and I am orange and contemplative. All right, Carol? Yes, my name's and I am eggplant, <laughs> and I would also say exhausted. And Phyllis. Hi, everybody. Um, I picked green from that picture, and I just associate green with envy. Joe. I am blue. <laughs> That's an emotion too. Yeah. And I have no emotion. <laughs> Did they hear you? Yep. Yeah. They can't see me. And Lexi? Hi, I'm Lexi. Um, I will go with indigo and lively. And Lisa, hi, nice to see you. Hi. Um, I had a webinar before this one, so I'm usually a red person, but right now I'm feeling green. And that's unusual because I'm not a green person. I'm feeling peaceful. Um, yeah. That's how I'm doing. And then I think we have Terry and Charles on the same, but you can each introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Terry and um, another color purple. And the feeling is calm. 
you have a color? I am Charles and my color is brown, which means I'm ripe. Did I miss anybody? I think you got everyone. So Okay, great. I have to apologize. I am having some internet instability. So if there are awkward pauses, um, it's probably because I have you frozen for a moment there. Um, I love that there's so much green happening. I think that's really great. Um, it ties right into the matcha tea that we're going to enjoy in just a bit. Um, if you haven't had a moment to get your tea supplies together. I'm hoping we can all enjoy that. that um, if you enjoy um, a bit of this ASMR video um, called A Mindful Morning with Margaret Ozaki Graves. Uh, if you're interested in the whole thing, it's available as part of the Kintsugi exhibit. So Courtney is going to drop that uh, link. And the portion that I want you to enjoy um, is time coded there. So just you, you can just scroll to about two minutes and 33 seconds and um, watch the making of the tea. And then we will do that ourselves. Is anybody unable to watch the video? No? Okay. Welcome, Becky. We are watching this video, um, which I'll put in the chat for you at this time coded time from 2.33 to 
All right. Hopefully everyone got at least a little taste of that from the video. You're welcome to view it uh, in a bit if you like. It, um, it takes you through a whole morning and it's quite a nice video um, for relaxation purposes, especially if you're an ASMR person. Um, but let's go ahead and get into our matcha tea drinking now. So um, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with matcha tea, or maybe all of you, and maybe it is something less familiar to others. So just want to give you a little bit of information. Um, so matcha is different than other types of tea because rather than it being a dried tea leaf that is infused into water, it's actually young green tea leaves that are finely stone ground into a powder and dissolved into the water itself. So you're not just getting the essence or the flavor of the tea, you're getting the, the actual entire um, tea leaf and consumption. Um, <clears throat> thank you for bearing with me. I went on my phone because of that internet instability. So there aren't two of me, I'm just on two devices at once. Uh, so I hope that you find both something energizing and relaxing in the experience of drinking matcha tea. There's a whole culture around it. There is something called cha no yu, which is the art of tea. I don't know if anyone here is a practitioner of tea ceremony or if anyone's attended a tea ceremony or service before, but um, what we're doing today is not that. Uh, there are several different types. Um, they change varying on season, uh, but they can last up to four hours. And um, what we're doing today is just sampling and enjoying the tea. So if you have some water to heat, I would recommend that you start that now. I'm going to do mine. It should be 175 degrees um, if you're able to, um, you know, uh, have a temperature to heat your water to, it should be heated to 175 degrees or boiling, and then just let it sit for a little bit, which I'll give you plenty of time to do as I'm talking about this. So where did tea come from? Like many things in Japan, it um, came over from China in the ninth, around the ninth century. And um, the art of tea was propagated by um, Sen no Rikyu, who was a Zen Buddhist teacher and the father of, of the art of tea. It's not just about the tea leaves and consuming um, something that will energize or relax you. It's about a whole multi-sensory experience. And artistry in, in all its forms at um, all times. So along with, um, it's a multi-sensory experience. So we're enjoying and tasting the tea. We're also enjoying the implements as the pieces of art that they are. And uh, we are enjoying the environment. So part of that um, can incorporate other sensory uh, uh, applications. So for example, if um, you have some incense or um, a candle that is scented, you're welcome to bring that in to this practice right now. I have some incense going. Um, I This is not a flower arrangement, but I do have some uh, flower with me here. If you want to surround yourself with some of those extra sensory things while you enjoy your tea, um, that would be quite natural. So all that you need to make your tea is something to drink it in, the matcha tea powder itself, um, hot water, and something to stir it with. But if you um, are 
interested in the more traditional way, um, there are a whole range of tea utensils, a few of which I'll show you right now. So um, we have the chawan, which is the tea bowl. Um, this is in a tenmoku style, which um, is shown by its light color. And you'll notice that it, the painting and the glaze on the side is irregular. That's kind of brings in this philosophy of wabi-sabi. So this naturalness, this imperfection, this impermanence um, that infuses the whole philosophy of the tea. Um, we have the cha shaku, which is a tea scoop. And we have, if I can find where I put it. Oh, I thought. Tea whisk. Cha sen. So hopefully that gave you enough time for your tea to, your water to heat up. I'm putting my matcha through a sieve today. You don't have to do that, but you can if you like. And if you're using regular measuring implements, I would say about a quarter of a tablespoon for a cup serving. There's two different styles. There's thin and thick style matcha. Um, and then we have modern um, contemporary servings like, you know, your sweet matcha tea latte that you might get at uh, a contemporary coffee shop. But I'm making mine thin style today. So in the ceremony, there's a whole, um, order of operations and choreography that I'm not going to try to imitate or implement because I'm not certified um, tea ceremony clinician. But we use the tea whisk. If you have one of these, you want to get a nice froth on top and stirring in both directions. The froth I am trying to show you, let's see here. <laughs> yeah, and then the most important, uh, important part of enjoying tea is the slurping. So this um, is good manners, it shows that you're enjoying it, but it also changes the mouthfeel and your um, perception of scent, flavor um, and texture. So don't be afraid to slurp as you're drinking your tea. I really like unsweetened matcha because it has this kind of grassy, um, fresh flavor to it, but also um, being whisked, it has a, a creaminess as well. So, um, I don't know if anyone is making tea along with me, but if you are and you need some more time to get it prepped, let me know right now. Otherwise, I will keep moving forward. All right, so I'm gonna send you to breakout room. Hold on, Meg, there is a question here. Oh, great, a question. Oh, a hard time getting the froth. Do you need more matcha? So froth, uh, that could be the case. Um, it could be temperature related as well. Or um, if you, with the tea whisk, you wanna make sure that you're not going to the base of your chawa, you need to keep it up closer to the, the top of where the tea is, because we're aerating the top. We're not like mixing 
it really, we're just trying to, I mean, we are mixing it, but we're also trying to bring some air into it. So whisking the top and you should get, it sounds like the sound of washing rice, kind of, um, if that, for those of you who wash rice. And for those of you who don't, just listen a little bit. So, and with your tea whisk, you kind of want to make an upward motion. So we're going around this way, but we're also going around this way at the same time. Hopefully that helps a little bit with the froth. It, you know, and practice makes perfect too. Um, there are people who spend years learning how to do this in the most proper way. So just keep practicing if you don't have froth yet. Um, you can always make another cup and try it, try it again. Um, so I, if we don't have any other questions, yeah, I want to send you off into breakout rooms to um, discuss the tea experience. Um, if you had it right now, um, maybe think about um, your immediate experience if you didn't partake in tea right now, but have had matcha before, I just want you to think about how you describe the flavor and texture of matcha. For me, my matcha today is, um, is thin and grassy and fresh in flavor, but a little bit creamy too. Um, you, can, you can talk about what the experience of tea is like for you or what your experience today is like so far. And then also, um, I mentioned about these, this multi-sensory aspect. So thinking about chanoyu, which is the art of tea and enjoying it, um, koro, which is incense appreciation. So if you lit a scented candle or have incense going like me right now, and kado, which is the flower appreciation, um, whatever is in your environment, that you want to speak about. We'll give you three minutes to do that with a new friend and don't be afraid. <laughs> I said, Gary and I weren't done talking. We had a great breakout. Ah, uh, good. Oh, good. I know that's so like, <laughs> from, from an educator's perspective, that's the great and poor, well, it's, it's great about breakout rooms, right? Because I have total control over how long I get to talk, but it can be a, a quite jarring exit. So apologies for, for any of those of you who we interrupted your conversation. I'm glad that we're having some, um, some great conversations. I, I feel like a, an, the energy in the space. So that's wonderful. Um, I saw a question from Carol about preheating your bowl. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Under normal circumstances, we want to do that. I rushed through things a bit because I talked a little bit too much and I want to make sure we get through all three of our exercises. Um, if you want to see or experience a more full preparation of the tea, you're, you can check out that um, mindful morning video, which has a, a bigger demonstration than, as I said, uh, you know, there are tea practitioners who extend the process even further. Um, and I invite you to check out some of those resources too. So um, I want to move into an exercise. This is going to be a little bit more time consuming and um, you certainly don't have to be on video for this. Actually, I invite you to, to turn your video off. Um, and to move to a place where you don't have to see yourself on screen. Um, if you are in a space where you can be comfortable um, laying on the floor in a semi-supine position with your knees bent and the points of your knees facing up towards the ceiling, that would be ideal. Um, or if you can sit in a chair, uh, you just need to be in a space where you can relax, engage in the exercise and feel your body, but not um, close your, have to close your eyes in order to do that. So if you can find a place sitting or laying on the ground where your eyes can be open, but not distracted by an image 
um, that would be ideal. So this is a constructive rest exercise taken from Alexander Technique. And Alexander Technique, if you haven't heard of it, is an educational process that um, people use to retrain habitual physical patterns um, in their movement and to retrain their posture. That it comes from this philosophy that when you're born, your body is in the ideal harmonious physical setup. So if you think about this image of a one-year-old child um, who is just learning how to go from crawling to walking and they have this big old head on the small shoulders and body, but they're able to balance themselves. They're able to, maybe sometimes you see them kind of finding their balance, um, but that is kind of the ideal posture and the ideal state of physical harmony that we're trying to achieve through um, Alexander Technique practice. And it's called Alexander Technique because the person who created it, um, his last name was Alexander. Um, and I came in touch with it through my work as a musician and singer. Um, there was a woman named Barbara Conable um, who had been doing work in yoga and her husband was a cellist and she discovered this Alexander Technique work which had been used exclusively with dancers and actors until that point. So um, the idea is that musicians do a lot of repetitive body motions and that through the practice that they do, they develop tension and, and um, through the process of trying to perfect their art, their bodies begin to lose track of that harmonious balance. So whatever your balance issues are, um, they don't, you don't have to have a physical issue necessarily if you're just feeling out of balance um, physically, mentally, emotionally, this um, constructive rest exercise is designed to help you to hopefully find some calm and harmony. Um, I am not a practitioner of Alexander Technique and this exercise actually is something that is intended to be um, a self-guided exercise and to help anybody um, whether they're practicing Alexander technique or not, find some self-awareness and give themselves a bit of self-care. So um, people who are in practice could do this for 10 minutes once or twice a day. Um, so we're going to just explore it a little bit. I'm gonna take you through um, several different states. So that setup state, which I described to you. Um, so if you're not already on the floor, or seated in a comfortable, posi comfortable position, go ahead and get that ready for yourself. If you are in that position and you feel like your head and neck have a lot of tension and there is, um, or if you're feeling tension in your back and you have access to a pillow or blanket that might help comfort and soften there, feel free to apply that. Um, so now everyone is in their setup. I'll take you through, um, an exercise of expanding your awareness. Then we're going to observe our bodies. Um, we're going to talk about inhibition and direction, um, noticing and engaging inhibitions and communicating with our bodies in very gentle ways, um, noticing our breath in doing so. And then we're going to come up and out of the exercise um, which I'll allow you to do kind of at your own pace. So um, we're going to go ahead and experience the exercise now. So in your setup position, I want you to go ahead and allow a sense of space on all sides of your neck. Perhaps you feel the back of your neck first because that's um, where you're engaged with your environment or where you're holding your tension. And then I want you to, to find a sense of space on the sides of your neck. 
if you think about the part of your neck extending down from your ears to your shoulders, and then your throat. And go ahead and, and swallow and feel the front of your neck. And as you finish that swallow, you'll feel a natural sense of space open up through the front of the neck. I want you to allow your arms to relax. And if you're laying down, your elbows to rest against your lower ribs, torso or abdomen. If you're in a seated position, just let your arms relax on your lap and let your elbows rest in a bent position where they feel comfortably unengaged. Keeping your eyes open, calm your mind. You might be thinking, I have so many things to do this afternoon. Oh, it was such a hectic morning. You might be thinking, wow, this is boring. Just try and release those thoughts. Let your mind be at ease and soften your gaze. Not looking at anything in particular, see if if you can um, have a sense of what you can see in your periphery without moving your gaze downward or upward, soften that focus and see if you have a different sense of the space around you. Think about your eyes being level above your cheekbones rather than looking downward towards your body or looking upward towards your mind. And as you find moments of this soft gaze, let your awareness expand to the room around you. And let your awareness include the sense of your body in that space. Awaken the sensation of your body and rise, let it rise up to your view. You may sense your eyes wanting to pull down to see your body. That is the opposite engagement. See if by finding periphery, you can allow the sensation of your body to rise up to your eyes. Take a few breaths of rest. Notice your body pressing against the floor or the seat if you're in a seated position. Where does your body make contact with your environment? In those places, observe the weight of your body. Observe where the surface is taking on your weight and observe where you are holding yourself up. Observe gravity and observe your resistance to it. Take a few breaths and rest. Observe any narrowing or compressing in your body, perhaps in your throat or in your abdomen, perhaps somewhere else. As you observe, let go of what you do not need to do. If you observe places that are holding, is it because they have to, or because you think or feel that those parts of your body have to be holding? Don't judge them, just observe. Actively hold on to that engagement. 
take a breath, silently say to yourself, I don't want to let go. And engage in the sensation of holding on a breath until it intensifies and naturally releases. Then move away from that. Explore how some muscular effort is needed to keep your body upright. See how little you can do and still operate. Explore relaxing and releasing. Be very careful if you're doing this in the chair. And if you fall out of position, simply take a breath and send yourself back into the posture that we set up. Now we're going to explore different parts of our body. And I want you to first tell yourself that you don't have to try to do or feel anything. You do not have to work physically to move your body. You do not need to engage your mind and worry about doing this right, wrong, or doing anything at all. Take a breath. Invite your neck to become freer so that your head can float at the top of your spine. Invite your back to lengthen and widen. Invite your knees to ease forwards and upwards. Invite your shoulders and elbows to ease outwards and away from your chest and back. Draw an awareness to your breath and the movement of your body as you exhale. Inhalation is your body's natural response. Allow your body to take over. Take a breath and invite inhalation to happen, rather than actively pulling the breath into your body. Take a few breaths and invite parts of your body As we approach coming out of this exercise, hold on to your first response to the idea of leaving this exercise and then release it. Come back to expanded awareness and slowly through a process, come to a standing position. If you're laying down, do this very slowly starting and slowly rising. Over time, everyone should come to a standing position. See if you can engage in that expanded awareness, seeing both what is in front of you and in the periphery. Invite parts of your body to become freer. Maybe your neck can become freer and your head can balance on top rather than you holding it in place. Invite your torso towards lengthening and widening and deepening. Invite your knees to be easy rather than stiff and to point forward and away from you. Invite your shoulders to widen and relax and resist the temptation to judge or measure this activity. If you happen to fall asleep during this, um, that's totally natural. So that's why I rang the gong. 
this exercise is concluded now. Um, we're running a little late on time. If you have any feedback on that, um, you're welcome to share it with me at the conclusion of this workshop. But I want to introduce a breath exercise um, that I use in my vocal practice. I have, um, basically the idea is we have lots of different types of breathing that we can do. Feel free to explore these along with me as I describe them. So you might notice when you're feeling fear or anxiety that you suck that inhalation in, in a way that we tried to um, explore against in our constructive rest. Explore sucking a breath in and notice how your shoulders and clavicular area might raise up as you're doing that. Imagine if you were running a race and you're taking short breaths in, um, in quick succession, <laughs> or you're trying to blow out breath very quickly. <sighs> that engages um, those areas, but also has a different sensation to it. So we're going to do um, a very short exercise that explores the singer's breath. The idea is that we don't want much movement or engagement in the shoulders, the clavicular area, or the high, um, the sternum area. We want to um, keep all of this pretty stable. And I want you to put your hands on your stomach and see if you can feel your viscera pushing out into your stomach as you take a low, slow breath. So if you were breathing in a milkshake through a straw. And go ahead and hiss that out like a snake. If you have a chair and want to drape yourself over it, you can feel that expansion through your back too. So I'm gonna give you kind of a at timing, we're going to explore the three phases of breath, inhalation, suspension, and exhalation. And the idea is that by slowing down each of these phases, um, well, in the singer's case, this is what allows us the, um, some of the stability and breath energy needed to sing high and loud. Um, but for our purposes today, this should be therapeutic and providing you some relaxation. So I want to start and we're going to take that inhalation in through the straw for a count of five. We're going to suspend for a count of two. And then we're going to exhale for a count of five. I will be counting off, so I'm not actually going to be doing this, but I invite you to. So we're going to inhale, two, three, four, five, and hold two, and hiss, two, three, four, five. Now take a cleansing breath in and out. This may have been relaxing for some of you. It may have engaged some tension for others. If you were feeling tension in your throat or you were feeling your shoulders engage, this next time, see if you can do the opposite. See if you can allow your shoulders to lower. See if you can allow your throat to open. Um, maybe the straw breath isn't working for you. Maybe you just breathe naturally through your nose at that count. So explore different things. We'll do this two more times. Um, we're going to do a count of five in, a count of five suspending, and a count of ten out. If you don't have that much breath, just do your own thing. So take a cleansing breath in and out, and we're going to inhale slowly, One, two, three, four, five, suspend, two, three, four, five, and hiss, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Cleansing breath in and out. One more time. We're going to take a breath in, two, Three, four, five, suspend, don't find tension in it. Try and relax and hiss out, or just breathe out. Three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, we're at our one hour time. So if some of you need to dash back off to your work, I won't be offended. If others of you have a moment and want to reflect or share, I know Courtney has a, just a little reminder um, for those of you who weren't on at the beginning about our Kintsugi programming, I'll let her remind everybody and then I'm happy to do a little Q&A or hear people's responses for about five minutes or so. Thanks, Meg. Um, that, was, that was very relaxing. I feel wonderful, um, especially that last breathing exercise. I just feel um, like I'm floating. Um, Thank you everybody for attending our first Kintsugi Lunch Hour. Um, again, we're the Japanese Arts Network and um, this session was with Margaret Ozaki Graves. Um, next week we have a really wonderful session, which is completely different from this one. It's with Sutsui Sensei from Colorado Budokan Karate. Um, he'll be sharing his healing and recovery path through the mindset and practice of karate um, after experiencing a near fatal car accident and he will um, do a talk back and Q&A session and then um, really exciting our USA Karate team member from Colorado Akemi Tsutsui Kunitake will teach us a kata um, called Sanshin which was created to unify the mind body and spirit so um, again thank you Meg thank you to um, Denver Arts and Venues and McNichols Civic Center building uh, for this cultural partnership uh, please visit our our website ja-ne.org. Um, it's newly newly revamped, and um, there's a lot on there about um, work that we've done with other organizations. So, without further ado, I'd love to to let everybody um, go, unless you'd like to stay on and um, have conversation with Meg. So, thank you again for joining us today for this uh, mindful Kintsugi hour. <laughs>